Welcome listeners, friends, witches, wizards, muggles, warlocks, and hags, squibs, and everybody else who are all equal. Uh, Welcome to Witch Please, the inaugural podcast in which Marcel Cosman and Hannah McGregor, that's me, (laughs) talk about our feelings and thoughts about the Harry Potter series. I'm relying on you 100% for the actual content of what it is that we're doing right now. We're going to do great. Marcel provides the structure and I provide the content. So we've uh, divided this inaugural uh, recording into six segments to help keep us on track. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we should get straight into it. That sounds great. We decided to call one not not an official segment uh, and it's called Opening Chat. Oh yeah, it's it's time for uh, for opening <laughs> chat. This is gonna be the feelingsist part. We've had several cries already tonight, so <laughs> at least two. I'm a little bit weepy right now. <laughs> just feeling emotional. So opening chat. So so we have just finished rereading Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Mm-hmm. Um, in my case, this is the uh, second time I have ever read it. That's amazing to me. It is amazing to hear you say that this is only the second time that you have read this book because I've probably read this book maybe five or six times. However, however, I will say that around the time that the sixth book came out, I stopped rereading Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets because I felt like I'd read them so many times already that I didn't want to reread them before moving on to the later books. Um, And so this was the first time that I had reread this one, holy smokes, in maybe five, maybe five years. And you were saying it was a lot better than you remembered. It is so much better. I have been, I've been telling people, including the love of my life, Trevor Chow Fraser, who is hiding somewhere in this apartment feeding some cats. I had been telling him that, you know what? The first one, not very good. Slog through it. The rest of them are worth it. And I swear to God, this one is so good. It's amazing. I'd really forgotten how exciting it was. Like, I think that at this point, the the trope of the young adult novel that involves being inaugurated into a magical world you hadn't realized existed seemed so trite. Um, but it's it's actually still an incredibly thrilling thing to read. That move where you go from the kind of depressing suburbs of London into this magical world where you're buying quills and wands and a fucking owl all of a sudden. The owls. The owls. It's a it's it's beautiful and it's amazing and I I adore this book. I completely forgot how much I love it, and I haven't reread the other ones yet, so maybe it will pale in comparison to the rest of them. But rereading this one, I was filled with joy. I was so excited. I cried. I fully cried, like ugly cried. Two (laughs) separate moments. Just fully evoked tears from me. And one, one of those moments I now feel ambivalent about, my, my feeling of childish triumph, um, mm-hmm. During that final rewarding of the the oh. house points in which Gryffindor steals the house cup from Slytherin, I have I have ambivalence about that. But I, when I read it, I wept. I wept with joy. But not because you identify with the Gryffindors. No, just because I love Neville so much. Yeah. Yeah. God damn, I love me an underdog. Oh man, Neville. If we only knew what Neville would become the first time we read these books. I'm looking right now at a sticker on Marcel's bookshelf that says Trevor, and it's reminding me of the deep and profound joy that I have in the fact that Neville's toad is named Trevor. (laughs) That goddamn toad. That goddamn toad. Do you know what these books would be called if they were about Neville? They would be called Neville Longbottom the Underdog. They would not be called Harry Potter and anything. It would just be Neville Bo- Neville Longbottom, the underdog. What do you think he's doing, like, all the rest of the time when everybody else is having adventures? I'm pretty 
sure that he is in his four poster bed crying because oh he's lonely <laughs> and he doesn't have any friends. He's, he... he's probably talking to, to Trevor the Toad about how he doesn't have any friends yet because he's not very good at magic. Oh, and also, I mean, he's missing his, his grandmother, who is so kind to him. She hates him. She's so mean to no, him. No, she's nice to him. He has an abusive great uncle um, oh who my. throws him out a window one time, which is how they discover oh, that he can bounce. Yes. But his his grandmother <laughs> loves him. She sends him the remember all because she, she knows does. he's useless. She does. But it'll come up later on that she's not as nice to him and does not accept him for who he is as much as she could. I need you to stop spoiling the later books because I genuinely don't remember anything that happens. Marcel already revealed earlier this evening that Hedwig will eventually die. And I'm really angry about it. I'm not laughing because she dies. It's actually the worst moment. It is the worst death. It is the worst death in the Harry Potter universe. Let's move on to the first official segment of Witch Please, Flourish and Blots. So, uh, named in honor of the bookstore in Diagon Alley, um, which Marcel recently pointed out to me when spelt out says diagonally, which is <laughs> incredible. Um, our first segment is devoted to a little bit of book it's history. It's just diagonally. It's so, not your fault. So this is our book history segment in which we, um, we reminisce uh, where we originally got our copies of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Mm-hmm. Hannah, why don't you go first? Yours is more interesting. Now this is, I, I have some um, fuzziness around this. I'm fairly certain that I read the first book sometime after its 1997 publication. Um, I'm pretty sure that I did not read this in grade seven. I feel like I didn't read them until high school. Um, so I think that I read the first two after they had been published. Um, I believe the versions that I currently own of the first three are a hardcover box set, which I believe I got from Christmas for Christmas from my family. Um, I am not sure if that's the first time I read them. Uh, but those are the only legitimately acquired Harry Potter books that I have. But you know what? The the tales of my um, criminal past <laughs> and the ways in which I acquired the later Harry Potter books will have to be saved for later episodes. It's beautiful. Foreshadowing. It's beautiful. Um, I have two copies of the first Harry Potter book. I have Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which I purchased from the Word used bookstore in Montreal for a total of $5.95. I also have a copy of the Scholastic Edition of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, the well-known American version of the first of the Harry Potter novels, uh, which has a few minor changes. So I have... Uh, I have I have two stories about these books because I have two of the first books. The first is that um, this uh, so this friend of the family, uh, his name is Fraser House. Um, he is the first person who ever actually convinced me to start reading the Harry Potter series. Um, I had been refusing to read it for years at this point. Um, I guess this would have been, I would have been 19, so this would have been 2002, so the Harry Potter books themselves had been out for, I guess, about four years or so, uh, and I kept refusing to read them, and I was over at his house, and he just thrust the book at me and said, just read it, in this way that made me feel so ashamed for refusing to read it anymore, and I said, fine, I'll take it, and I started reading it. Uh, another sort of key background piece of information to this was that I had very recently gone through um, a breakup with my then long-term high school boyfriend, and I was having a really hard time with it. Um, but what I will say is that when I started reading it, because I was having such a hard time with the breakup, I had said to myself, by the time you finish this series, you will be over that relationship. And I can honestly say that, like, 12 years later, <laughs> when I did finally finish this series, I was indeed over that breakup. 
Um, it didn't quite take that long, but I just thought that was a, a rather funny thing where when the, uh, when the seventh book finally came out in 2007, so like six years or whatever later, I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. That relationship's super behind me now. (laughs) So back to when I was handed this first book from this friend of the family, um, I very begrudgingly and reluctantly started reading it and dropped the goddamn book in the bathtub uh, and was really embarrassed because I had ruined the book that this that this friend of mine and friend of my family's had lent to me. Um, so instead of giving that book back to him, I bought him a new version, a new, um, proper version that says Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, a Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and gave that to him and then kept the, um, withered and watermarked, uh, version from Scholastic. And then because I have some kind of compulsive problem, I also picked up a used copy of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So now I have two. Well, you wanted to make sure that you had a version that had the proper British language in it. Yeah, yeah. The American nonsense that's in the first one. Yeah. It's nonsense. Yeah, it's nonsense. We don't like that here. No. Here in the colonies. No, not at all. Our second segment is entitled The Boy Who Narrated. And what we're going to do in this section... Our erstwhile tech support is giving us some stink eye because he doesn't like the name of our segments. That's fine. That's fine. He's got some feelings. We don't care about the patriarchy here. Uh, So the boy who narrated is uh, is going to consist of our our ongoing consideration of Harry Potter as a a more or less reliable narrator. Mm. Um, And the thing that sort of started this off for me is my my profound issue with the Slytherins. Mm, Um, mm -hmm. I remember distinctly um, having a conversation with my mother about this novel after we had both read it for the first time and her saying that she had really not liked it and had no intention of reading the second one because she hates this trope in children's books where there are just characters who are evil and they are allowed to be evil Mm -hmm. Um, and that she thinks that that is uh, incredibly absurd. And on rereading this, I've really found myself agreeing with her, though I don't think that I did at the time. But now as an adult reading it through, the way that the Slytherins are treated in the book is as as villains. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the house that you go to if you're evil and everybody in it is terrible and has names like Crab and Goyle, which are <laughs> which are comical villain names. Yeah. Um And every other house is united in their dislike of Slytherin. Mm -hmm. Um, And that just seems, you know, and Snape is, even if, even if it turns out at the end of the first book that he hasn't been actively trying to kill Harry, he's still horrendous. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and this was bothering me deeply until Marcel proposed the possibility that maybe we shouldn't be trusting the narrative of an 11 year old boy. Right. The, the thing that had occurred to me was that, um, well, actually, it was Hannah's, it was also Hannah's idea about the way in which Hermione Granger is represented in the first half, if not two thirds of the first novel, where um, she's deeply unpleasant, intolerable at times, just super frustrating and obnoxious. And all of a sudden, once Harry and Ron and Hermione become real friends, she stops being obnoxious and starts being delightful. She, as, as the book actually says, and I quote, Hermione had become a bit more relaxed about breaking rules and so on. Um, and so we talked about this a little bit and I suggested that maybe it wasn't that Hermione changes her behavior. It might just be that the story is told from Harry's perspective and from Harry's perspective, Hermione stops being this obnoxious person who's telling him what to do and starts being his friend. And so as a result, he starts to think of her differently. And maybe the same idea of the Slytherins is a useful way of looking at the way that the houses are divided. Mm -hmm. That, That what we get at this point when Harry is 11 years old and likely to see the world in very black and white terms is that 
Um, you know, his friends are unambiguously good and the Slytherins are unambiguously evil. Um, and we're going to see that complicated as he continues to mature as a narrator. Um, the other sort of signal I think we get that he might be an unreliable voice um, is the scene of the Mirror of Erised, mm -hmm. um, which is, I'm sure there are a lot of moments like this, but this is the one that really stood out for me, are moments when, um, I mean, it's dramatic irony, right? It's moments when you, the reader, are offered a piece of information that the character doesn't seem to perceive. And in that moment, it's um, when he first sees the Mirror of Erised. There's an inscription along the top of it. Um, which is, I mean, it appears to be some sort of gibberish or magical language, but when read in reverse, so in mirror image, it actually spells out a particular phrase um, that describes exactly what the mirror does. Um, Harry does not realize this at any point in the novel, and it's, I think, a good signal for us that we need to understand that there's a divide between how Harry sees the world around him and, and what we as readers might be able to see. Mm-hmm. And so throughout the course of uh, this podcast, and as we are examining all of these novels, we're going to be taking a fairly... Hmm, um, a hermeneutic of suspicion, one might say. I would never have said that, but yeah, yeah, a hermeneutic of suspicion. We will be treating all of the chapters that revolve around Harry's perspective as deeply and fundamentally suspicious. We should probably, as a rule, take for granted that the chapters not from Harry's perspective, which are few and far between, but do exist, and we will flag them and talk about them, we should also probably take those not for granted either and consider from whose perspective they are. They are. From whose perspective they are. They are. <laughs> Good. 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 Words are hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we see that very much in the first chapter in The Boy Who Lived when mm -hmm. we're when we're seeing the world from Uncle Vernon's perspective. And the novel is telling us in a pretty heavy handed way um, that the world is what you do or do not want to see in it. Totally. Right. So what's mm -hmm. that? What's that absolutely brilliant line that you identified? This is my favorite thing in the whole world. I underlined this uh, on rereading it because it was just a beautiful summation of how I personally go about my day. And it really stuck out to me. <clears throat> the line is, Mr. Dursley, however, had a perfectly normal owl-free morning. And the reason he has a perfectly normal owl-free morning is because his back is to the window where all of the owls are swooping all over the place at the on the day that he who must not be named, also known as Voldemort, we call him who he is here on this podcast. <laughs> Voldemort has been defeated... And Vernon Dursley, who is a muggle and knows nothing about what's going on, has a perfectly normal owl-free day because he's not paying attention. I think it's time for segment three. Let's do it. Segment three is entitled Potions Class. And this is the one where uh, the two of us as, um, as, I mean, we're as legitimate professors as the people called professor in this book oh for sure because there's no reason for me to believe that there's a tenure system at <laughs> hogwarts um because they come and go fair i mean mm, tenure might explain snape but yeah that aside and professor bins who is a ghost he's dead but he's still a professor <laughs> he's still a, teaching it's a pretty good metaphor for tenure <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, as, as, as two individuals both located within the university system and responsible for teaching, we're pretty interested in, uh, in the pedagogical methods being practiced at Hogwarts and, mm -hmm. and more generally in what the school means and what it means to set a series of seven novels entirely around a school, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, if anything, this is the story of this school. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to start uh, with a question. This isn't an official question. We'll get to the real official questions later on. Um, but my opening question is, uh, is whether Hogwarts is the only wizarding school in England or if it's just the most prestigious mm. wizarding school in England. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is this is a tricky one because no matter what answer one chooses there's always so much 
silence to support your idea or so much silence to contradict your idea that it's really hard to say. I think that there are a lot of clues that suggest that maybe there are other wizarding schools that are just, you know, not as good. But if that's true, so let's say, let's start from the premise that there are in fact many different schools and that Hogwarts, as Hannah suggested earlier this evening when we were chatting, if Hogwarts is the Eton of witchcraft and wizarding schools, why is it that good wizards who are good enough to get into Hogwarts don't also get invitations to those other schools? I'm, what I understand about about the, the British public school system could fit into a thimble. Um, but you have to assume... So there's a scene where Neville explains that his grandmother was surprised that he got into Hogwarts because she didn't think he was good enough. Mm-hmm. And that implies right there that there are mediocre wizards who are not getting into Hogwarts. And so then the question becomes, well, where do they go? They can't, they can't go to muggle schools because we know that muggles don't know across the board. Muggles don't know about wizards and witches. And so they don't know about that whole world. So there must be a place that mediocre wizards go for education because otherwise you would just, it would just be a common thing to have a whole bunch of mediocre witches and wizards running around causing havoc Mm -hmm. in the muggle world. And that's not a thing that we deal with. Yeah. I mean, there's this real question of what happens to witches and wizards who fall through the cracks, like Hagrid, right? Mm -hmm. Who is this sort of liminal figure in relation to the school. Mm -hmm. Um, And the school becomes... You know, this, it's such a self-enclosed world, um, and it's so sort of carefully monitored and ruled over by this, um, this, this incredibly powerful and incredibly good figure um, of Dumbledore. We were talking about him earlier as being omnipotent and omnibenevolent, mm-hmm. um, because he is, I mean, he knows everything that's happening in the school. It's the safest place. He's, you know, explicitly called um, the most powerful living wizard at multiple points. Um, so that Hogwarts is not just a school among many. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this really sort of um, specialized space that only the select few get to enter. Um, and the implication does seem to be that that select few isn't just people who are magical, mm-hmm. but a certain, you know... Uh, upper echelon of those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because you have so many, you have so many students in their first year coming from muggle families who have never used magic before or don't know anything about magic. And it's a complete surprise to everybody. And if it was just a matter of the best wizards and witches, then that those people would, unless they were extremely special, like say a Hermione Granger, they would be immediately cut out because they wouldn't have practiced. They wouldn't know how to use magic. They wouldn't come from a background that gave them any kind of insight into developing those skills. So that can't be it. There must be something else, some other way in which those witches and wizards are chosen and selected by Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. Uh, This would be a good point to um, mention that uh, we are fully aware that there is a body of scholarship out there about the Harry Potter world and that very likely many of these questions have been answered. Um, We have absolutely no intention of researching any of this. (laughs) We we research so many things in our work already that we are relying 100% on the actual Harry Potter texts to provide us with the answers to the questions that we are asking and if those answers are not there we're just going to speculate back and forth at this table it's a remarkably new critical approach that we're taking to these books right we're just if it's not in the text it doesn't count like close reading only no yeah close reading only it's not real otherwise yeah um so there's so we have this this environment a sort of rarefied environment and within it we have um sort of multiple models of what uh pedagogy might look like Mm -hmm. um and those models are i think at this stage um remarkably poor uh i mean 
again, if we think back to the the fact that we're getting only the perspective of an 11 year old on his teachers, um, that's not surprising, right? Mm-hmm. That these teachers are sort of either these vaguely comforting figures of authority or these explicitly malevolent sort of enemies trying to ruin your life. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I sort of remember feeling that way about teachers when totally. I was younger. Yeah. Um, but we have, you know, the models of um, pedagogy that we have include, um, I mean, Snape, who is uh, in- insane. I mean, I know people love Snape, and I know that he, like, redeems himself to some degree as the series goes on. But, but we just, don't know why yet. But just treat him as a teacher. He is a terrible teacher. Terrible. Right? Who oh else do we God. have? We have Dumbledore, who has this very strange relationship with Harry, where he's constantly um, sort of manipulatively doling out small amounts of information when mm-hmm. he decides Harry is ready for them, and letting him do incredibly dangerous things and not intervening because he thinks that Harry needs to do them. Mm-hmm. Um, again, really inappropriate behavior with an 11-year-old. Totally. Absolutely. We have Professor McGonagall, who we both, Hannah and I, adore Professor McGonagall because... She is extremely strict and severe, but is not without a soft spot. And she's she's not a monster, but she doles out punishment as it deserves to be doled out for sure. But she she appears to be the only instructor who is not. Well, no, I'll also say that Professor Sprout is like this, too. Professor Sprout and Professor McGonagall are do not seem to favor their own houses in the way that we see um, Snape, for example, obscenely favoring his own house. And again, this this could go back to the fact that Harry, if if these chapters and if this novel is coming from Harry's perspective, Harry, as an 11 year old, is seeing his treatment by Snape as obscenely unfair. So maybe it is that he's just reading He's just reading those interactions as Snape favoring the Slytherins over everybody else. But we definitely see that McGonagall and Sprout. Who's the head of Ravenclaw? Is it Flitwick? I wonder if it is. I can't. I, I can't remember. I don't, I don't think we're told in the book. Yeah, they because don't make Ravenclaw it clear. doesn't matter yet. No, not yet. None God, of the other no. houses matter yet. They'll get. They'll <laughs> no. get more important. Um, but we certainly. Uh, spoiler alert. Um, our next episode will be um, about the first uh, movie adaptation. Oh, I can't um, wait. And that, if we assume that the movie itself is not um, through Harry's eyes, but mm-hmm. is a sort of, you know, objective version of reality, which movies encourage us to uh, imagine, then all of a sudden Snape's behavior is no longer justifiable. It becomes completely bananas. That's the technical term for Snape's behavior. bananas. And also my new model of how I'm going to teach all of my classes. (laughs) Slamming into rooms, cloaks billowing. Making weird, shifty eye contact around. Just, anyway, just yeah. looming over students and making them super uncomfortable. It's all it's all a really good model. Nevertheless, one thing that is beautiful and consistent all the way through the seven novels is that Hogwarts as a place is a kind of sanctuary. It is a space of learning. It's a place where children come and turn into adults. And there are multiple ways in which the types of activities and the environment at Hogwarts facilitate that process. Um, And I don't know, it's something that really warms my heart. It makes me feel really good as a teacher and as somebody who is personally invested in the education system. Yeah, I think it's unsurprising that a lot of people who are now academics uh, find that the Harry Potter series has this special place in their hearts because I think if you have a great deal of faith in the kind of good that education can do, Mm -hmm. um, then this is going to be, you know, a, a really heartwarming series of books. I mean... 
when you're when you're faced with disillusionment about the corporate university <laughs> and um, you know what is happening to higher education in this country, then you can turn to these like this remarkably heartwarming fantasy of of a a school that is sort of a space beyond politics or that wants to be because we do see that Mm -hmm. getting corrupted later on yeah absolutely i would like to mention um one side note here which is that um the forbidden forest chapter oh yeah shocks me it shocks me it doesn't make any sense it doesn't like ba- based on the rules of Hogwarts, based on the fact that all students are forbidden from entering into the Forbidden Forest, it makes zero sense that for detention, first year students would go into the forest. Like, I'm, they're I'm they're sorry. being punished for being out of their what do you, what do you call it? Out of their common yeah, rooms? out of the the yeah, we're words Words. um but they're being punished for being out at night right because Mm -hmm. it's dangerous right Mm -hmm. and so i mean this is why you punish children is because they're doing something that's dangerous and they're not smart enough yet to realize what's good for them or not good for them so you have to punish them for endangering their own lives and so your punishment for them sneaking around at night is to send them into a forest (laughs) full of monsters in the middle of the night without adult supervision. Well, Hagrid's there. He is, he makes them split up (laughs) and he sends two of them off with a dog. With a dog who he then says is a coward. So deeply inappropriate. Um, But that's, you know, we'll, Mm -hmm. we'll get more, we'll get more of the, the pedagogical problems and beauties of Hogwarts um, (laughs) as, as the series continues. But I think it is now time we're on the the perfect topic for this because segment four is called the forbidden forest. This is a segment in which we discuss uh, race and class and bodies. Three out of four of our favorite things to talk about. Absolutely. All right. Would you like to start us off? I don't know. I Honestly, I don't know where to start. There are so many things that I want to say about this. There's so many things. Oh, how about we start with this? Do, 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 you watch? Okay. So it is, it is a common reading of the Harry Potter novels and the Warner Brothers Harry Potter movie adaptations that the goblins of Gringotts that is the bankers are Jews this is a common thing most people are familiar with this if you've never heard this before I strongly encourage you to take your fingers out of your ears and to open your eyes and start paying attention to the types of criticism that Harry Potter has received over the last decade um and it's, it is not unsubstantiated. The novel describes them as swarthy and clever. We also, in, in re-watching the first movie, which we will talk about later, but in re-watching the first movie and in re-reading the first novel and paying attention, it is fairly undeniable that the that the goblins of Gringotts have distinctly Semitic qualities. So Marcel's uh, claim or her proposal is that uh, as we read the rest of the books, we watch out for any characters um, in the world of witches and wizards who might be actually just Jewish. Right. And, and her proposal is if we can find an actually just Jewish character, then we can let the books off the hook for their representation (laughs) of the Gringotts goblins as explicitly Semitic. Yeah, I mean, one of of my feelings about this is that if, if if we're looking at a world of private schools, and if we're looking at a world where the kids who are going to the private school called Hogwarts are all celebrating Christmas, then maybe there's a private school 
uh, that is devoted to Jewish witches and wizards. I mean, we have so far in this first book no evidence of that. What would it be called? That's a hard question. Uh, Hogwarts with a Z. <laughs> it wouldn't say hog in it. That's not. That's true. It's not kosher. That's true. Uh, it would say something. It would maybe be uh, smogwarts. <laughs> silver warts. It would be silver, silver warts. warts. It would be silver warts. Gold warts. Gold warts. It would be gold warts. Gold warts. Right, gold I'm warts with a Z. I'm glad we covered that. Um, so, <laughs> Jew Watch, Jew, Jew Watch, that is the end of Jew Watch. Um, so the next, the next thing, I, I don't remember if the later books spend as much time talking about food as this first book oh, does, or that maybe food is more exciting in the earlier books when food was so, so exciting for you, like as an 11 year old. Oh, totally. Um, but the images of the completely unlimited quantity of food offered to these children um, is baffling to me in terms of the kinds of body politics that we see mm-hmm. in Hogwarts, which is to say that these are, you know, in the scenes of eating, these children are unsupervised, presented with unlimited quantities of refined sugar-based foods. <laughs> And then offered nothing in the way of physical recreation. In fact, first years are explicitly banned from playing the only sport that seems to exist in this world. Which, as Hannah pointed out to me earlier tonight, does not actually involve any physical activity at all. You are just sitting on brooms. You're just sitting on a broom. Okay, okay, okay. Those of you who are Quidditch enthusiasts out there in the world, I... There, you use your arms for things. It's true. You have I mean, to like, like catch a ball. It's like polo, right? So like, I guess polo players, I mean, riding a horse takes a lot of fitness. So maybe riding a broom also requires like enormous amounts of core strength. You know what? You probably need really good core strength to stay upright on that broom. You need those, you need to, you need to use those quads, right? You gotta, you gotta hold your knees together. And... Yeah. Inner thighs. Totally. Yeah. You know what? I take it back. It's a great sport, but <laughs> But You're, first years aren't allowed to first play. First years are not allowed to play. Our only possible proposal, which occurred to us as we watched the movie, is that it's all the staircases. Because mm-hmm. there's so many staircases in the fucking castle. Nothing else makes any sense. It doesn't make any sense that you would just be allowed to eat unlimited numbers of turkey drumsticks. Yeah. You just have a platter of turkey drumsticks in front of you. Yeah. So yeah. there's that. So this- alongside you watch, we're going to have fat watch. <laughs> Looking out for some fat witches and wizards. Because so far, um, other than poor Professor Sprout, who's explicitly called dumpy, which is a cruel and unfeminist adjective. Um, other than that, I see no sign that witches and wizards get fat. And Not that's, even remotely. I don't understand what's going on there. One theory that I may have, which ties into our, um, our reading of, of class, is that a lot, of, a lot of these students are probably coming from poor households. Um, so if we take the Weasleys, for example, the Weasleys have seven children, which is too many children. I think we can say unequivocally, seven is too many children. You've done something terribly wrong. However, God bless you, because all of the Weasley children are beautiful and wonderful. And the Weasley family d- deserves all of the medals in the history of time. But you have this family with, as my grandmother would say, umpteen children. And, and they're poor. And they're super poor. Maybe because they're sending all their children to public school. But which public school in the UK means private school. Yeah. It's crazy backwards country. Costs all kinds of money. But when they're at Hogwarts, they have all the food they can eat. So for like eight months of the year, mm-hmm. wait, how long is that? They go from September until June? I have no idea. I'm, it's September. I'm sure it's September ten until... Months. Ten months. Trevor has signed at us that it is ten months that they are there. Okay, good. So our tech support confirms <laughs> that this is 10 months. So for 10 months of the year, they are eating three sweet square meals a day. That's another very important point that Marcel made, um, is that uh, they eat three meals a day. There's no mm-hmm. snacking. Oh, no, nobody no can snack. snacks. And I think that when mealtime is over, the food disappears. Yep. So there's only so much eating you can do within... Yeah, it's weird. It's weird, this combination of, of sort of completely unrestricted plenty mm-hmm. and then, like, ruthless restriction. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Totally. 
I I can't even I can't even fathom what it would be like to show up to dinner late and grab a single drumstick of meat and then have everything disappear from you when you haven't even taken a bite yet. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've eaten a drumstick of anything, but I can only imagine the feeling of complete and utter loss that you would experience <laughs> not being able to eat like the goddamn mashed potatoes and cranberries. Just those mashed potatoes remember. so badly. <laughs> so side note, I've had to look up several of the foods that they eat. Describe two of them. Okay, so one of them was, as it turns out, I can't remember the word for it, but it was at Christmas and it was a kind of sausage. Oh. It was like they have like turkey, goose. No, goose. They have goose and then all of these other things that I knew what they were and then something that I didn't know what it was and it turned out that it was secretly sausage. Um, and that was really confusing to me. Um, that's the only one I can remember. Though, I do recall the first time that I read these books, um, having no idea what pudding was. Because you'd never had pudding before? No, because the British refer to dessert as pudding. Pudding just means dessert. And so they talk about having your pudding. People aren't eating a ton of pudding. (laughs) (laughs) They don't just... They don't just have like <laughs> Jello pudding cups. No, they just don't, no, they don't no. Have, we can't talk about Jello brand anything anymore. It's not feminist. They don't, <gasps> no, fuck you, Bill Cosby. You ruined everything. You ruined pudding. Um, no, we can reclaim it in the British sense. Mm. And now it just means like cake. That's nonsense. It's a delicious moist cake, at least. Is there anything else we need to talk about? We haven't really gotten as much into the exciting eugenic subtext oh, as we will later on. We should we should talk about that scene when Malfoy encounters Harry in Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry. Let me backtrack. So this is the first time that they encounter one another, but Malfoy doesn't know who Harry Potter is, but Mal- but Harry gets a real good sense of who Malfoy is. And so later on, on the train, when Harry and Ron are sitting in the same compartment and Malfoy shows up, learning that this is Harry Potter, who he had met earlier, Malfoy puts out his hand and says something along the lines of, you're going to get to know that there are some wizarding families that are worth knowing and mm-hmm. others that aren't. Yeah, something about the right kinds and the wrong kinds of wizards. Yeah. I, I would like to flag at this point um, for future consideration, though not necessarily right now, um, the fact that if we're thinking about racial purity, about sort of mm-hmm. pure bloods versus mud bloods as being a, a discourse of racial purity. Mm-hmm. Working class whites have historically upheld an interest in racial purity more strenuously than upper class. Um, that, that is a very frequent way that class and race intersect, as we see it in the southern United States. Yeah. So it's very interesting to me that the Weasleys, while being, being a, a working class but pure blood wizarding family, are in fact this model of sort of the ideal um, attitude towards mudbloods. And on that dark note, it's time to turn to our penultimate segment, triumphantly titled Granger Danger! Granger Danger is the segment where Hannah and I spend a little bit of extra time focusing solely on Hermione Granger, who, as feminists the world over agree, is the rightful hero of the Harry Potter series. So, to restate a point that we've already made, because... If you like my point once, you will like it even more the second time I make it. <laughs> Hermione is treated outrageously in the first half of this novel. In, in Inexplicably. And inexcusably, except insofar as you read the novel as being from Harry's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of want to do that. I want to read it as Hermione herself is just fantastic from day one. She's just 
good at everything. And she's really prepared, right? She recognizes she's entering a situation where she's not necessarily going to know what's going on. And so she's proactive. Mm -hmm. She reads ahead in the books. She equips herself with the knowledge that she will need to survive in a new and strange environment. And she enters that environment with a confidence that is born of the fact that she actually knows how to do shit, right? (laughs) Like she is the only character who has confidence that is earned, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody else is just sort of walking around feeling like probably they're pretty important, uh, but they don't really know why. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like Draco Malfoy, for example, is is that the the perfect example of an overinflated sense of self-importance that isn't based in anything. Um, I mean, Hermione in that way is such an incredible feminist hero from the first moment that she arrives on our page, right? How does she show up? She shows up helping somebody else, helping Mm -hmm. Neville, right? She finds the underdoggiest underdog and is like, I'm going to help this guy out. And then very quickly, she's like, oh, are we doing magic? Cool, check out how good at magic I am. And the the fact that the novel frames her as needing to change before she becomes an acceptable companion Mm -hmm. to the protagonist and his best friend, I find really unacceptable. It's a bit frustrating, actually, because... Um, the novel also points out to us, it's, it's when they're in potions class, the novel points out to us that um, Harry has also done a handful of reading before the semester started. So this is the scene, it's the first scene in potions class when Snape is badgering Harry, he's asking Harry all of these questions. Hermione's hand is basically scraping the ceiling. It is so high in the air. And Harry is thinking, and and Snape is, is accusing Harry of having not done any work before the term starts. And Harry is thinking, well, he had actually read ahead in some of his books, but he couldn't be expected to have memorized everything. And I'm willing to say that that's true. You can't be expected to memorize everything, except that Hermione has taken it upon herself to study thoroughly and make sure that she is entirely prepared for the f- for whatever is going to come at her and she proves this throughout this entire book whatever comes her way she is prepared to deal with it with the exception of the troll which for some reason when she's in the bathroom crying and there's a troll in there She's not prepared to deal with it. I find this really unbelievable. I find this entire chapter to be extremely frustrating and not believable. I mean, it feels really false um, because it it doesn't feel true to her character, right? It feels like um, she is the one who would know how to deal with the situation. It's a falsely created um, situation that's supposed to redeem her as a character from being the unbearable know-it-all who's too interested in rules. Uh, and yet in the, it's the fact that she is extremely good at school that saves them because she is the one who mastered that spell first, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, she tells Ron how to, she reminds him what to do when he's doing the, the levitation spell, the Wingardium Leviosa spell. And um, I it, it really struck me towards the end as Harry and Ron become increasingly obsessed with uh, the secret of the Philosopher's Stone, that Hermione is the one who is there saying, we are students at a school uh, and we need to study for our exams. Um, She's the one who actually remembers the space that they're in and the sort of social contract of the institution that they're located in, which is we do not get to come back next year if we do not study and do well on our exams. That's one of the really um, beautiful and exciting things about Hermione's character is that she's always, always bringing us back to the fact that this is a school, they have exams, they have revision to do, they have assignments, they have homework, they have essays to write, and she's always helping Harry and Ron. And all of the advances that they make as a trio are always dependent on Hermione's own personal knowledge base that she's that she's gained from spending a significant amount of time uh studying and and practicing her her assignments Mm -hmm. which is part of why i felt so outraged that at the end um as there as she and harry are contemplating who should drink the potion that lets 
them proceed into the final room where the Philosopher's Stone is hidden and who should drink the potion that requires them to go backwards, um, Hermione says, oh no, Harry, it needs to be you um, because you're a, you're a great wizard and all I have is book learning and cleverness, mm. that there are things that are more important than that. Though, I, I do need to point out that she is the one who makes the decision in that scene of who gets to go forward. She is the one who decides that Harry is more capable of dealing with that situation than she is. And ultimately, um, Harry is able to triumph in that scene because of abilities that once again came to him via a woman. Yes, exactly. Had Hermione gone forward, she would not have had the ability to stop Quirrell because the only thing that prevents Quirrell from defeating Harry is that Quirrell cannot physically touch Harry and Quirrell cannot physically touch Harry because Harry's mother cast a spell or her love for him or whatever protects him because Voldemort killed her in the act of defending Harry. And so Voldemort, who is currently inhabiting Quirrell's brain or skull, or I don't understand exactly how that works, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. He's on, he's on his head. He's on his head. <laughs> he's, he's occupying the space where his turban once was. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the Voldemort turban on Quirrell's head uh, causes Quirrell to not be able to touch Harry. And that is because of Harry's mother. So there's a lot of really significant feminist subtext to the power of magic and the way in which magic functions. And I, and I feel like the way in which that gets gendered in the novels maybe has a, it, it has the potential to kind of throw it away to sort of be like, oh, like love, that's lady magic. We don't really need to take that seriously. But Hermione Granger is always there to remind us that lady magic is much more interesting and defined and historic than just a mother's love for her son. There's a lot more to it than that. I believe that this brings us to our final segment. Our final segment is entitled Final Revisions. Um, And what we're going to do in this segment is uh, take turns asking one another questions that we had upon completing the novel. Um, And so uh, this week, It is my turn to ask Marcel some questions. And my first question is, in the novels, do they wear pants under their wizard robes? This is a beautiful question. I have no idea. I would, I would assume that they wear some kind of trouser because... They don't wear kilts. But it it never describes them having to buy school uniform trousers and vests and shirts and ties like you see them wearing in the movies. It only describes them having to get robes which are fitted to them Mm -hmm. so that they're the right length. And thus you're left with this image of 11-year-olds walking through a courtyard on a windy day and their poor bare white calves showing as the wind <laughs> blows their robes up, which is a tragic image. That is deeply soul crushing. I don't know. I truly don't know. The only, the only, um, the only experience that I have to answer this is purely that as a youth who attended a uniform school, it was mandatory that the boys have pants and the girls have a kilt. And then eventually the girls uniform came to include pants as well. So my assumption, if this is an old British system, my guess is that it presupposes that men wear pants already and that eventually Women start wearing pants, which is why they don't actually mandate whether you wear pants or not underneath your robes. What I would add is that given the length of the robes, you can probably wear whatever you want underneath. All right. I will accept, I will accept that answer. 
Um, not because I think that it's accurate, but because it comforts me. <laughs> because of the image of them wearing just these wizard robes was so, so sad. Oh, God. All right, question number two. I'm ready. So in Professor McGonagall's class, um, there's a scene in which she shows them what transfiguration looks like and then proceeds to make them write down a bunch of complicated notes and formulas. And so my question is, is transfiguration applied physics? Go. I would say, obviously, what else is physics good for if not for transfiguration? That's all I've got. Great. Great. I'm convinced. My final question, and this is the burniness. No, the robes question was the burniness, but this one is also very important. Is centaur society purely homosexual? I'm really excited that you asked me this question. Of course. Too excited. I'm so excited that you asked me this question. I would say no. The answer is that it is not purely homosexual. It is purely homosocial. But the reason why it is not homosexual is spoiler in book five they carry a lady off to do terrible things to her as a form of punishment oh my god they do what you'll get there wait until book five you literally could not have to go find it right now that is horrifying yeah it's horrifying it's Uh, terrible so it's a homosocial rape-based culture entirely 100 percent Okay, I'm seeing more now why the Forbidden Forest is forbidden. It's super forbidden. You shouldn't go there. (laughs) You really, really really shouldn't go there. Like, it's not just fucking tarantulas that are in there and, like, unicorn-eating monsters. They're, like, rapist horsemen who are running about in the Forbidden Forest. It's, like, 100% forbidden. (laughs) So forbidden. All right, so, uh, Marcel, do you have any, any final thoughts you'd like to round out our consideration of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone? I guess, I guess the one thing that I want to make sure that I, that I put on the record before I forget that I ever wanted to say it, uh, is that they call the Deluminator a put-outer in this first chapter. That'll change later on, and I don't know if that's a rolling change or if that's a like editorial change where they're like a put outer is a stupid word you need to find something better to call it than a put outer but anyway so there's that all right so you're gonna end with the beginning and i'm gonna end with the ending and return to my my ambivalence about that final scene um because i was so excited for neville more than anybody else the fact that neville is awarded 10 points for being willing to stand up to his own friends um, breaks my heart into a thousand tiny pieces Um, because it's one of those triumphant moments in which Dumbledore really is just the voice of moral reason and he gets to stand up in front of everybody and say what's right and what's wrong and of course we know that the Gryffindors are the good house um, and so what they've done is right and we know that the Slytherins are the bad house and so they deserve to be punished Um, but when you take a step back as an adult and consider what's going on here, um, the Slytherins are also children. They're they're just they're just little kids. They're just little kids who have also just been trying to you know do their best to to get points by winning at sports and doing well in their classes. Um, we know that they're not absolutely evil. Um, and if they're encouraged into a sort of um, irrational level of competition, maybe that's because the head of their house is a crazy person. <laughs> um, but the way in which the other three houses triumph over the Slytherins and all stand up and applaud for the Slytherins' loss, um, it actually, now that I've gotten a little bit of distance from the novel, it, it grieves me. I think that that's actually a really, a potentially really painful scene. Yeah, it's heartbreaking because even even if Professor Snape isn't a madman... Which he is. Which he is. He's also, as we learn later, entirely motivated by his own sense of undeservedness. 
right? The fact is that he has grown up believing that he doesn't deserve to be there and has been pretending his whole life to deserve to be there. And so imagine having as your as your schoolhouse's representative, someone who believes that you either are born to deserve to be there or that you have to fight to the death to, to deserve to be there. And it's not a great role model. It's not a great person to teach you how to be in the world. It's actually a pretty good reminder that um, while some people who go into education do it because, you know, they believe very strongly in the values of education and want to care for children and help them become better, other people stay in school for their entire lives because they've never grown up emotionally. Oh my and Snape God. is trapped in his own adolescence perpetually. I mean, to to be actively punishing Harry because you didn't like his dad? Oh, God. You're an exactly. adult. What is wrong with Get you? over it. Honestly. <laughs> so maybe my feelings, my feelings about Snape may change as we watch more of the movies. And I'm reminded of how much I love Alan Rickman, which is so, <laughs> so, so much. Um, but I have to say the Snape of the books um, is just, is just making my inner professor very unhappy. <laughs> So stay tuned for our next episode when we tackle the first Harry Potter movie and all of our feelings. Yep. I hope that you are excited for um, commentary such as, I fucking love the fact that the toad's name is Trevor. (laughs) It is going to be magical. Thanks for listening and have a magical evening. (laughs) 